Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to uh, the second meeting of the Audit and Risk Management Panel for this municipal year. Um, I'm Councillor David Gardner. I'm the chair of the panel. And I'm very pleased to say that this evening we have a full attendance. Mm -hmm. So uh, could I welcome uh, Councillor Lade Olegbemi, uh, Councillor Christine May, Count Dr. Susan Blackall, uh, Councillor Matt Hartley, Councillor Nick Williams, Councillor Dave Sullivan, and uh, it's also um, be like to introduce um, Damon Cook, the Director of Finance, and uh, very pleased to see uh, Jonathan Meek, uh, our external auditor from Grant Thornton, uh, whose last appearance at the Audit and Risk Management Panel. Um, and uh, we've got our clerk, uh, Daniel Wilkinson, and it's good to see other officers and Councillor Ivis Williams also uh, in attendance. Um, so, uh, that means that I have received no apologies for absence, as we're all uh, present. Um, I've not been notified of any urgent business. Uh, does any member have any declarations of interest? I see none. Um, then we move to the substantive items on the agenda. And uh, the first and most substantive item is the annual audit uh, letter and report of for 22-23, so that is over a year ago in terms of financial years, um, and uh, that's going to be introduced by uh, Jonathan Meek of Grant Thornton. Do, do you want to say a few words first, Damon? Yeah, no, I'm just going to keep it brief anyway. And it was just to set the context, which I think, I think, Chair, you've done some of that already. So just to bear in mind that this is the 22-23 uh, annual audit letter. Um, we are sort of at least one financial year um, down, down the line from there. And just to sort of bear in mind that, obviously, these um, the assessment's done at a point in time. That is now a sort of a while ago. And whilst I, obviously, obviously there's going to be a number of questions arising, you know, from um, from the report itself. I think it's just worth bearing in mind that we are a long way down the line. A lot has happened. A lot of positive things have happened since that point. But I'm, I'm sure we'll come to those uh, sequentially. Um, and I'll hand over to uh, Grant Thornton. Thank you, Damon. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Meek, um, Associate Director in Grant Thornton's Public Service Advisory Practice. Um, I've sit for a qualified accountant with a background in public sector audit. Um, I will sort of declare right now I've not been closely involved in this work. My colleagues who uh, delivered this work for Grant Thornton have all taken this week off on holiday, so I have been parachuted in to uh, deliver this uh, report to yourself. So I'll answer the question, any questions to the best of my ability, but there might be a need for us to. Um, to come back if there's any clarifications that I'm unable to answer, but I have been briefed. So, yes, as, as set out, I'm here to present our annual audit report for the 22-23 financial year, which is our final year as um, auditors, external auditors of the Council. Um, so the purpose of the report is to uh, detail our assessment of the council, Council's arrangements for securing value for money across three core areas. Financial sustainability, which relates to the planning of resources to ensure adequate finances. Uh, governance around the council making appropriate decisions in the right way and improving economy efficiency and effectiveness so improving the way the council delivers its services we present our overall findings across each of these three areas and have raised recommendations as appropriate and i'll deal with each of the areas in turn but if you refer to page three of our report you'll see that between our 21 22 uh, annual audit report and our 22 23 um, annual audit report, there's been a, so, uh, there was a negative uh, movement in our assessment of arrangements in so much that across financial sustainability and um, improving economy efficiency and effectiveness, we raised significant weaknesses um, and uh, associated key recommendations, which I will come to shortly. Um, across governance, there has been no movement from our assessment across the two, but we still have raised improvement recommendations. So I'll cover each of these sections now in turn, starting with financial sustainability. And we identified a significant weakness in the council's arrangements for securing financial sustainability. Uh, the reason for us identifying this significant weakness is uh, the challenging financial outlook of the council 22-23, and also the, the approach taken by the council to mitigate overspends against the budget in that year. 
So in 22-23, the council delivered 25.1 million overspend on services, but this was mitigated through one-off measures, including the use of reserves. This follows up from 21-22, where the break-even position was once again achieved through one-off measures. Um, repeated use of one-off, uh, so in our view, repeated use of one-off mitigations, especially the use of reserves, is not a sustainable financial um, strategy for the council to, to, to take, um, and we've raised the significant weakness in relation to that. Um, also, with regards to the medium-term financial outlook of the council at the point of our review, the MTFS indicated that the council will be facing a cumulative budget gap of 50.4 million. Subsequent uh, updates to the MTFS has revised that gap, um, most recently in March 24 to 54.2 million. This is a very challenging, in, in our view, this is a very challenging outlook for the council. Um, it's mitigated to some extent by the fairly substantial level of reserves that the council held or holds at the, at the point of our review. However, as uh, previously mentioned, the, what, the use of reserves to mitigate budget overspends and deliver balanced budget is, in our view, not a sustainable strategy. And the council needs to deliver substantial recurrent savings um, over the 12 months to avoid the reserves rapidly depleting and, um, at the point of our review, putting the council in position of risk potentially by 25, 26. On that basis, we've identified a significant weakness in the council's arrangements for securing value for money and raised a key recommendation that the council, and this refers to both officers and members, must acknowledge the gravity of the medium-term financial outlook and take far-reaching action to restore a sustainable financial position. The development of a robust, deliverable savings scheme is essential, and further details on this recommendation, along with management response, can be found on page seven of our report. And I will um, mention here, that, that Damien mentioned previously, that obviously this was referring to the arrangements in 22-23, so we acknowledge that the council will have made um, uh, steps to address these recommendations into subsequent financial years and obviously the, the current financial year. So that context is, is important. Um, we've also with regards to financial sustainability, we noted that the council had difficulty in developing and delivering savings plan and we've raised an improvement recommendation. Um, we recommend that monitoring reports to cabinet should include a more detailed analysis of savings development and more specific commentary on savings delivery. This will support the council's efforts to implement greater robustness and accountability in delivery of savings plans by the services. Further details can be found on page 19 of our report. Um, we do, in our report, acknowledge the key areas of financial pressure faced by the council in terms, most specifically, the, the homelessness pressures and social care, both across adults and children. Um, and it's vital that the council continues to take mitigating actions to reduce pressures being faced in these areas. Um, our second improvement recommendation regarding financial sustainability re relates to the housing revenue account. Um, our recommendation is that the council must review its HRA planning in the medium term and take effective action to restore it to a sustainable position and protect the minimum working balance. Further details on this, including management comments, can be found on page 20 of our report. So, um, moving on to the second area where we've identified a significant weakness in the council's arrangements in securing economy is a, and that's a, securing economy efficiency effectiveness, um, which we refer to as the three E's. Um, this specifically relates to the regulatory notice issued by the regulator of social housing with respect to the identification of failure to meet minimum service standards. We acknowledge that this regulatory notice was a result of a self-referral by the council and that the council is also taking steps to resolve recommendations of the notice. But uh, it is a Grant Thornton firm-wide national approach that any local authority subject to regulating notice has a significant weakness in securing arrangements um, uh, for achieving value for money. Further details of our recommendation can be found on page nine of our report. Um, with regards to improving economy efficiency and effectiveness, we've also identified two improvement recommendations. Uh, one is a governance review around council companies to ensure that they're doing value for money, and page 39 of our report provides more detail on that, and that the council should undertake a planned procurement review as quickly as possible in order to address issues identified in procurement and contract management procedures. And page 40 of our report provides further detail on that. The third and final area of our review um, uh, for value for for the council achieving value for money is governance. And we've not identified any significant weaknesses in the arrangements, but we have identified six improvement recommendations. Further details on these recommendations can be found on page 26 to 34 of this report. Um, I do not propose to go into those in any detail, uh, but um, 26 to 34 details are improvement recommendations in relation to governance. So, um, 
As I said, we're conscious that our findings relate to the 22-23 financial year and the Council's made steps to address a number of the recommendations made. Um, and we report, we, but also in the report, we do note that at the point of our review, there were some prior recommendations that had not been addressed. And we encourage, even though we are um, no longer for 23, 24 onwards, the external auditor of the council, that those uh, recommendations are acknowledged and addressed to ensure that the council has robust arrangements um, that any future auditor will be subject to assessment. And that concludes um, the, uh, the presentation of our annual audit report for 22, 23. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, clearly, it's a very important and serious report. Just in terms of timing, um, in relation to what Damon said, obviously the report is for the financial year 22-23, but the report was signed and delivered this month in July 24. And obviously the audit process always involves a uh, significant dialogue, particularly with management and hopefully all the audit committee as well. Um, and I just wondered... Uh, certainly in terms of the, um, the, the recommendations and the review of the implementation of last year's recommendations, mm -hmm. whether the conversations and the narrative around that dates from the end of 20, April 23, or whether it's more recent and dates from when the report was done in July 24. So to what extent has the, this report taken account of uh, developments and uh, improvements towards those uh, meeting those concerns in um, during 23-24. Yeah, um, so with regard to that, I think it's best to refer to the management comment section, which is where uh, my understanding and Dame will be able to answer this is there was quite robust discussions between our audit team and council officers with regards to the findings and the management comments quite clearly detail the steps that the council has taken. So in terms of the arrangements, uh, our report is very much referring to the arrangement in 22, 23, but the management comments and updates with regards to that are much more um, timely. Damon. Yeah, so I think if we go to uh, either sort of page 21 of the pack or Page five of Grant Thornton's report, depending on, sorry, sorry, page 20 of the uh, agenda or four of uh, the audit report. Um, in there, there's reference to things like, say, the quarter two budget monitoring report, you know, presented to Cabinet, um, which was still towards the end of 2023. So, of course, that's quite backward looking at that point and only, <coughs> only sort of presents uh, where we were you know, uh, sort of part the way through that particular financial year. The comments, the management uh, sort of comments uh, can be found later on, which are on page 24 or, or page 8 of, of the audit report. And in there, as was said just now, this is the more sort of timely sort of aspect of it, which says, well, this is now what's happened. Um, and in here, it talks about the process for setting 24-5, so you can see the slight disconnect we have with time periods here. We have a report which is talking about arrangements in 22-3, yet we're able to actually comment on processes that are now sort of happening for 24-5, well, were happening for 24-5 at the time that this report was sort of being finalised. And that's where we saw a very robust response, for, again, from both councillors and officers, um, and as was identified was the need. Uh, to make sure that you know we've we, we've got you know everybody playing their part. <coughs> if you look on the management comments themselves, um, uh, there are a number of uh, sort of subsections on that particular page. The first part um, actually outlines the fact that uh, within the process, over programming of savings uh, were put into place. So this wasn't just about sort of getting to grip with you know what the problem was but actually saying, you know, we're going to try and go further here. The second point actually shows the, the fact that this was actually approached as much of a joined up uh, uh, sort of effort, um, as was referenced, councillors and officers. So the Grand Strategic Leadership Team, which is basically, um, it's the Cabinet and um, uh, the, the Senior Officer Team met very regularly, you know, throughout that period. Uh, to ensure that um, the, the savings uh, process, you know, was, um, was delivered. In terms of sort of overall sort of quantum as well, um, I mean, the overall process saw 118 proposals come forward that were agreed. 
with a value of 33.7 million. That's a fairly significant number. Um, you know, that's, you know, you're in the sort of ballpark of 10% of the council's net budget. So in terms of the council responding to the problem, yes, it did. Um, did people work together to, you know, um, to come up with proposals? Yes, they did. Um, and are, are we now getting on with the job of it? That's all to be sort of played out now. Um, you know, and uh, the uh, monitoring reports will be coming uh, through the cabinet process in the normal way and will also include, as well as the normal budget information, there will be the necessary tracking information on all of those savings and how they're progressing and being delivered. Thank you, uh, Damon. So we've got uh, a number of members have indicated they've got questions or comments. Uh, I saw Councillor Williams and then Councillor Hartley. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Damon and Jonathan as well for that report. Just a point of clarity more than anything, and it might be one for you this, Damon. When did officers first get sight, because I know we talked around it, of the recommendations and the findings to start acting upon them? Was there a particular point last year where you might have seen a draft? As the chair says, it was published July. I'm just trying to understand when officers would have had sight of the findings to respond. Thanks. Yes, I, 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 can't, um, I can't recall offhand uh, exactly when the first draft came out, but there has been significant uh, sort of to and fro um, you know, on that process. Just to come back. So, so roughly, like as a quarter, Q3 last year, Q2 last year, roughly? That... It will be towards the end of the year, bearing in mind uh, this... Um, uh, bearing in mind... <sighs> It's got to be around sort of late summer, something like that. Councillor, Hart Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for um, uh, attending and for the report. Um, I've just got an initial question for Jonathan, if I may. Um, it feels like the, the sort of obvious question that we as a panel should be asking is, is about this sort of top line statement that the auditors have given. The council's members and senior officers must acknowledge the gravity of the medium-term financial outlook and take effective far-reaching action to restore a sustainable position. Um, I accept, uh, bearing in mind Damon's point about timeliness and development since, some of which are noted in the report, could I just ask for Grant Thornton's opinion on what you have seen since the recommendations have been made, you know, based on your experience working with lots of authorities, would you now say that uh, councillors and officers have acknowledged the gravity of the situation? Yes, I'll try and answer this to the best of my ability. So um, that, as you say, is very much focused on the 22-23 arrangements that there was, uh, um, in the view of, of, uh, of sort of our work, there was a uh, reliance on one-off savings. And um, I, I don't use the word complacency, but um, the fact that the council has got significant reserves meant that the the pressure that facing some other councils that are in a similar financially challenged position but without that reserves um, wasn't necessarily um, being realised by the council. I think as, as, as Damon set out in the management comments, there's been clear steps to develop um, both the governance and the uh, detail behind the savings programme that are much more sustainable and reduce the reliance on, on one-off. So um, I'd say that... Um, again through the management comments and, and the response from management and I think the robust discussions that were had there's definitely been a, a progression in the right direction since uh, the 22-23 um, findings. That's, is that something we would expect that as councils continue to face the financial challenges they are and particularly in your instance with, with, with homelessness and the pressures that that is, that is placing on, on, on the budget that the, 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 the mitigating actions that are being taken and the, sort of that, the gravity of that financial situation is definitely much more the forefront. Okay, thank you. And I've got a follow-up question on the management response to that key recommendation. Um, so a question to Damon, um, or indeed um, uh, Councillor Highland, uh, whoever's best place to answer it. I was surprised not to see more about rethinking services in the management response, because reading the detailed of the uh, detail of the auditor's comments in, in several places, I would say the report is sort of quietly and politely damning of uh, the progress at this point in time, this snapshot in time, 
uh, that had or hadn't been made on rethinking services. And in particular, there's comments about the digital strategy. Uh, you know, to pull one out, we have some concerns that rethinking services and the digital strategy have received a significant level of investment but has reached a mature stage without delivering the significant savings that were intended for it. So at this point in time, it hadn't come up with the goods. And so I, could I just ask why that hasn't been addressed more fully in the management response and perhaps for a comment on that? Yeah, that's fine. I think we refer to that again, page 24 or, or page eight, depending on which version you're going for, uh, subsection six, uh, where 30 of the proposals, i.e. over a quarter of those, are actually of a rethinking type. Um, so um, that, in addition to, uh, if I recall, coming to scrutiny um, uh, uh, some months ago as well, actually sort of detailing the profile of the work and the profile of the delivery of those types of savings, what we were looking at there was effectively um, you know, a delay in those savings, but those savings actually coming through. So they will come through. They will come through later than expected, but they will, when they do, they're recurrent, i.e. they uh, will occur each year, and potentially will even surpass the original target that was actually set when that digital strategy uh, was first created back in 2020 when we were in COVID. Okay, so final, final follow-up then, if, if I may, Chair, thank you. Um, so it talks in here about, um, the auditors talk about reform being needed. It uses the word reform uh, of the Rethinking Services Programme. Um, can I ask Damon, what's been, uh, when he considers what's been introduced in the last year since this report, does he consider that that is the reform that, that has been you know, sort of pointed to in this report? specifically on rethinking services. No, and if, if we go back to the digital strategy, we're, we are at the end of that first four year cycle. So we're actually in, sort of in, the, in the process at the moment of re, redrafting, reassessing what, what's happened over that first four year period with a view to learning from that and creating the next, next, next sort of four year cycle. So we are in that sort of process of, re, you know, sort of reiterating you know what that looks like going forward and what's realistic and what's achievable okay um, I've had an indication uh, that Councillor Ivis Williams wants to ask a question but firstly I'll ask uh, further questions from members of the panel um, Councillor Nick Williams wants to come back are there any other panel members who had questions on this um, Councillor Nick Williams uh, thank you chair um, just a quick one really a point three on the management response uh, about savings delivery being monitored on a monthly basis with the hope for the first one coming to cabinet this July is my read is that still on track and has it I guess there's a cabinet tomorrow oh, sorry on Wednesday so will, will that be coming to that cabinet thank you uh, that's no the, uh, the 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 cabinet on Wednesday will be looking at the uh, outturn um, and the statement of accounts for last year uh, the um, uh, the first monitor uh, for the year uh, will be coming uh, afterwards, so that will likely be the September one. Okay, so uh, so it's just to reiterate what it says in there in terms of like the monthly scrutiny by GSLT is that's happening. But the first revenue monitor was meant to be for July. We're now saying it'll be September. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And then what cadence will that revenue monitor i get that it's being monitored monthly but the actual revenue monitor that full detail how regularly will that be presented to cabinet so again that follows the same um so there's a quarterly monitor uh that goes to cabinet so the first one um i think as we said just now will be in september uh and then the second one i can't recall when that's going to be but obviously that is for the period ending sort of 30th of september and that will follow in due course and again with um, the the necessary analysis uh, of the savings but all the while in between that monthly analysis is going on um you know between officers and uh, and, and and the cabinet um thank you um so just one or two questions from me if that's all right uh, like other members, I've read the uh, report 
thoroughly, so thank you very much. It is very important. Um, I, the, the recommendations there in relation to the audit and risk management panel, um, obviously we have already implemented some of the recommendations from 21-22 in that we have an in more a, a chair that's not also chair of overview and scrutiny um, and, 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 and we're having more training, a whole program of training, but um, your the suggestion is we have more independent members of ARM and just wondered if you could perhaps expand on that in terms of best practice elsewhere, in terms of the SIP for code and so forth on, on audit and risk management and uh, where we might draw these independent members from if we were to, uh, to go down that path. Obviously, it would probably be the next municipal year if we did. Um, I'm also interested in the recommendation, I think it's IR9, about council companies um, and the increased risk of lack of transparency and conflicts of interest and suggesting a review there and wondered again if you could mention what best practice there is from elsewhere in terms of council companies. Um, another area of interest to me, sorry to throw questions at you, um, is around the mis what you call I think the misalignment of budgets but in I think in last year's report you talked about um, there were some items on the budget like no recourse to public funds which are hardly on the budget but they happen every year and it's always an overspend or parking and uh, moving traffic contravention income is always a larger amount than actually is realized um, and treasury management, uh, the per surplus and treasury management is not in the budget. Um, so there are items like that which were mentioned in last year's report and I wondered, and this is, I suppose also a question for Damon, um, whether you're now happy that that has been addressed and Damon, whether you're happy now that the budget is, is, is more realistic and, and everything is catered for. Yes, yeah, so I'll try and take those questions in turn. So the first one around um, the um, audit committee, um, we've seen elsewhere where councils have had two independent members on um, on their audit committees um, to try and bring in a, um, an outside perspective. Also, sometimes that is to bring in um, a skill set that might necessarily be not be in the panel. So um, we've seen... Um, other councils where they've had uh, former external auditors actually sit or internal auditors sit on as independent members to bring skill sets that might not necessarily be there. Uh, I do apologise, I don't know the skill sets of this audit committee, so um, I don't know if that's something that, that, that would be needed. But in terms of um, best practice, that's what we've seen other councils do um, with regards to independent members. Um, then the second question, remind me, was with regards to... Council, the recommendations on council companies and the review what thereof and yes. your statement on them. Uh, yes, so um, ultimately best practices for councils to be, that have got companies to be fully aware and fully cited on, on the operations of that company. You're seeing from um, other councils that have always been in the news that issues have emerged when um, the council has lost focus and lost control almost of the operations of a company. So if you think back to Nottingham City Council and Robin Hood Energy, that was very much the council had lost sight of what the company was trying to deliver and that came at a significant financial cost to the council. Um, so it's really just having a, a, tight, a, a, a tight understanding and control of what um, the council is delivering and make sure that aligns also with the overall strategy of the council and what was, all, was almost set out to achieve at the start because actually if there's a drift away from uh, delivering what the council set out to achieve maybe there's a, a, a potential to divest from that because if it's not achieving the outcomes the council wants then there is a risk and that's sort of uh, our, in relation to that uh, and then remind me on the third point around budgets it was about the misalignment that the budgets don't always reflect um, what we know will be the actual income or the actual spend in some respects and I mentioned some particular items which were also identified in your 21-22 uh, report and commentary. Just bear with me a second. It's not one that I'm, uh, I was briefed on, so um, let me just have a quick look and I'll, I can come back on that one. Damon? Yeah. 
the I'll take a couple of things. Can I, can I just go for a point of clarification uh, from an earlier question? Um, the, the one that was puzzling me was when, when, when did we first see the, um, uh, the document? There's two documents that come out from, um, from the external auditor as, as, as you go through the year. No, three if you include the plan at the, at the very beginning. When you go through the accounts process of you know, submitting them to audit, you get an audit findings report. I think it was that that I was thinking about at the time. Uh, because that particular document, I've traced it back, probably didn't come out to about November. The annual audit letter, which is this one, is actually in this year. And I can't trace back that I've seen it probably before about February or March. So, so just, just a point of clarification on that one. Um, uh, then on the other aspects, so in terms of the realignment, so within uh, the budget for this year, um, uh, the, the budget process uh, which was set in March of this year, there was a significant deficit recovery um, uh, uh, sort of line that's in the budget. It was about 19 million, which was about sort of realigning those budgets. So the ones that were mentioned around sort of parking, you know, recourse and things like that substantial most treasury management as well. So you had a number that were basically suggesting they had insufficient budget. You had treasury management, which was effectively generating a surplus. So all of those have been realigned. And again, so when we come to see the quarter one, that will be very clear to see how that has been ironed out. Great, that's very heartening. Uh, right, before we come to Councillor Williams, back to Councillor Hartley then. Thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask about the follow-up of previous recommendations section in the report. So there are six, by my count, recommendations that haven't been addressed from previous years, and the report talks about the auditor's surprise at that. I wondered if we could ask um, the Cabinet member or, and or Damon to uh, comment why that is the case. Um, and, uh, you know, it is that going to be addressed? You know, when we sat here in, in 12 months' time, can we expect those previous recommendations to have been caught up with? All right. C could I ask if there's any in particular you want to have a look and we can probably go Yeah, I mean, a general comment on why there are six, I suppose, is the first question. But um, an example would be the one I'm probably, in a way, most worried about, I suppose, is recommendation four, which is this long-running thing about delays in management acting on internal audit recommendations, which is kind of been, is topical and has come up recently. So to take that as an example, but also the general point, if you could address. We did actually, just, just for your benefit, you were on holiday, Councillor Hartley, but this was an issue we raised at last week's audit committee with um, uh, the head of internal audit uh, about internal audit reports and the implementation of the review recommendations. And we have asked for a more granular schedule to come back to this committee. Thank you, Chair. Well, that, in, in which case, I'm, I'm more interested in the, the general point. You know, why are there six recommendations on here that haven't been acted on? It's more of a process question, um, I, I suppose, for, for Damon. Yeah, I appreciate the, 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 the general question. Um, I think it's more a case of dealing with them on a line-by-line -line basis in terms of, um, you know, whether they needed a, 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 you know, almost like a, a completely robust response or there was something that is going to be dealt with as a matter of course by something that's actually coming up. So I know the Chair's mentioned about um, asking for some additional information, in particular around those internal audit items. Uh, at the officer level, um, we've actually stepped up uh, arrangements whereby there is now um, uh, a... Uh, effectively an escalation process and also a reporting process at the, at the most senior level in the organisation now. So where we find that things have not happened um, as, as they were reported to have intended to have happened, then they are flagged and reported. Okay, so just on the general process point then, I'm hearing from your answer that some of them are more important than others. And that's the kind of officer, that's a reasonable kind of, you know, assessment of when you look at the recommendation. So just for example, recommendation eight about updating a centralized version of the register for gifts and hospitality. 
I can totally understand that. Looking at these recommendations, you, you would put that at probably the bottom of your list. That, I think that's totally reasonable. But could, who makes that decision and what kind of scrutiny is, or, is there of that decision? Because if we're actually saying, well, we're knowingly not implementing this recommendation, it feels like that should be documented, that decision, and, and subject to scrutiny. I mean, as, as I said, we take it on a line by line, but there's a risk-based approach to these things. And so for things like, say, contract standing orders, for example, if, um, you know, if you're looking at, or we'll, there was a recommendation, say, to, you know, something needs updating, the new Procurement Act legislation coming in says, well, we need a fundamental rewrite anyway. So are we going to do the minor tweaking or are we going to do the big bang approach? We're going to, we're going to invest the time and do the big bang on that. Thank you. Um, so, understanding orders invite Councillor Ivis Williams to ask a question. Do you want to come forward and use the microphone next to Councillor Highland? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, just out of just so you know, because I am the chair of the organisations and the community scrutiny panel, when I read the report. I, um, it's um, of interest to me. Uh, most of my questions have been asked as answer. I came here with five questions, one around the rethinking services. I'm satisfied with the answer that has been given by the officer. Um, you've already asked on, in terms of the um, related companies, um, because I think that needs attention. Um, but Councillor Hartley just asked about the um, recommendation. And when I read the report, um, the report does mention the 2020-2021 and 21-22 recommendation where the auditor was not satisfied in terms of how we respond to um, recommendations. So I know that uh, Councillor Hartley just posed a question to um, Damon in terms of how, uh, what assurance um, can we be given in that um, we will adopt or we will try as best as possible to implement these recommendations. So I just want to um, urge officers and members um, that we need to adopt a culture that promotes compliance and, and um, good governance, because I think most of the um, action points or the recommendations which were recommended as improvement were around governance. Um, but my main um, point, which I think that's the only question that's not answered really, is to the panel. Um, best, you ask about best practice. Some other councils has best practice where the audit panel um, have a tracker of um, improvement recommendation. And I just want to ask this panel, because most of these items there are of interest to my panel, um, is there a way to have some tracker or follow-up from this panel um, for these sort of uh, recommendation. As we have the new auditors coming in, we don't want to see, it would be embarrassing to see some of these recommendations. So I just want to ask the panel if that is something that can be considered um, in terms of tracking and following up on these recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Williams. I mean, I, that was something I've actually made a note of that in terms of uh, moving forward, uh, rather like with the internal audit review recommendations where we've asked for a tracker, which I have in other audit committees I sit on, um, I thought that might be useful to have a tracker or at least a report of the external audit um, recommendations uh, from 20, well, at least 22, 23 and 21, 22 and to come back uh, to, the, uh, to this panel uh, with a report on the... Pro now, obviously, there'll be some recommendations which have been superseded. One is mentioned there. Some recommendations which, for various reasons, cannot be implemented um, or are not a priority to be implemented, like the, the gifts and hospitality one, but at least to have some uh, explanation as to why they have not been implemented uh, or what's being done to implement them, I think, would be useful. Um, I just uh, seek the views of, of members of the panel, as so that would be useful to have a, a report and a tracker of the external audit recommendations. Agreed? Good. Um, are there any other comments or final questions from uh, members of the panel on this report? Councillor Williams. 
just to say thank you for the thoroughness of it and also when can we expect the next one, I suppose, to see what, what is the cadence of these reports for someone new to me? Would it be this time next year or we, further on? We did last, um, we, we had the uh, program for the 23, 24 uh, audit uh, with uh, Fervas Mazars and I think memory is that's due in January. Uh, is that right, Damon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the audit's not likely to commence until about September, so um, January is the working assumption uh, at the moment. But um, I think as, as most of the audit firms are sort of wrapped up in sort of some catch-up audits at the moment. Um, so that's, that's playing, um, should we say, a bit of havoc with some of the scheduling. Uh, Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could seek your advice. I don't have any further questions or comments on the report, but I do just have something to, to propose in terms of comments back mm -hmm. to full council. Do you want that now or later? If it's on this item, then now, yes, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, it's not, I just wanted to seek colleagues' views. Um, I, you asked the question, Chair, about the, recommend, the auditor's recommendation that we consider the current membership of audit and risk management panel and it feels like every time we see an annual audit letter the stakes get go higher and higher um, and I just wonder whether we might um, choose to comment to full council our view on that my own view is that we should we already have the benefit of an independent member which we're grateful for but um, as the stakes get higher and higher I wonder whether uh, you know my view would be that we do need further independent members of audit and risk management to help us as lay elected members who are not uh, experts by any stretch to scrutinize uh, what's in front of us. So I wanted to seek yours and colleagues' views on that suggestion. Well, I mean, thank you very much. As this is a, a recommendation that's come from the external auditor, um, I certainly would favor that. I would favor the idea of having someone with uh, who is a qualified auditor if possible, of which I'm sure we have many within the borough. Um, but, um, and that would be as an independent, non-voting member. Um, but, but I'm, and obviously we can only make a recommendation. It would need to be full council that agreed it, uh, probably for the next municipal year. Um, but open to other views that members have. Councillor Williams? I think, to be honest, it seems eminently sensible. My only concern would be, and we'd have to look at the detail of the, the cost and the remuneration for that additional member, we undertake it as part of our duties as councillors, and we welcome the external input from uh, Dr. Blackhall as well. But I, I think that would just have to be looked at would be the only caveat in these times, I think. But I'm never one to say we need less expertise. I think we're beyond the tide of experts phase now. So let's, yeah, in principle, great, thanks. Dr. Blackall. Just for clarity, I'd like to say that I am not an expert. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm vice chair of this panel because I am chair of the standards committee. It just so happens that I, I, my former career was in business, so I understand something about accounts and money, and that's helpful. But this is very complicated, and um, I, I don't pretend to be an expert, and so I would certainly welcome if it were possible, and particularly if we could get someone who would do it as you know, most of our independents do as largely as a voluntary thing. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Councillor Highland, on this matter. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, whilst uh, I've sat on trust as trustee, and we often have people with legal expertise and financial expertise, always a good thing. Um, however, Grant Thornton actually made an error in, in this report, in the sense that they thought we had no independent members. And we had to go back and say, actually we do, we'll have Dr. Susan Blackwell. So, um, yeah, they hadn't intended that we should expand the number of independent members, just simply that we should have independent member, brackets S, Completely down to you, panel, and, and I totally, utterly get the point. Thanks. Right. Um, 
so uh, in, in the light of that, do you still want to make a, a recommendation that, that the council considers? Something like council considers appointing a second independent member to the non-voting independent member to the audit and risk management panel um, that could provide with, with the necessary financial expertise. I think that's very eloquently put, Chair. And yes, and thank you for the clarification. Understood, uh, but I think the point yeah. stands. You're right, Chair. Is that, yeah. that okay, Councillor Williams? I would just like to, because that is news to me from the clarification, seek Grant Thornton's view whether one is enough or would they encourage more too. So whilst we have some expertise in the room, let's listen to it, which is what we're proposing to do. So I'd be keen to hear Grant Thornton's view in light of what Councillor Highlands just disclosed. Thank you. Yes, we, I think we, we do acknowledge that there was a, a mistake in the report. I think that was part of the robust discussions that, that took place. Um, the purpose of independent members is to provide that expertise that might not be in the room. So um, in some cases, it can be done with one independent member. Councils I've seen it uh, that have implemented it have two independent members. Um, and again, one of those independent members has, has got relevant financial skills. One of them is, has got a business background, so not necessarily the, the exact financial expertise. But yes, so um, that expertise in terms of the financial is important. And I think it's important there not to conflate independence and expertise, right? Because as Dr. Blackall's just said, you're not an expert in it. So the recommendation would be that they are independent, but also an expert, I think, in that field, because that's probably what we're now lacking, it comes to light, I think. Thank you. So. Thank you. I think that clarifies, um, and that, that's very helpful. Are all members happy, then, uh, that firstly we recommend uh, that we um, have a, 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 a tracker report on the um, external audit recommendations for the last two years on implementation of those recommendations and secondly uh, that we ask uh, full council to consider uh, it, it having appointing a second independent non-voting member with the relevant accountancy expertise. Yeah. Oh, Councillor Oleg Bemi. Um, I think it would be great if we could find out what the cost implications are first just in case um, there's a need for remuneration, if there are any financial implications, it would be great to find that out first before we make the recommendation to full council. So would you like to add to that recommendation something like subject to any financial implications? Yeah. Yeah. I might just say, though, uh, to, to uh, Dr. Blackall's point, um, as, and to your point, Chair, we have a borough full of extremely credentialed, talented people, and I think we could, f I'm sure we could find a public-spirited local resident with the relevant expertise. Uh, but uh, I agree with the point, uh, including it. Um, so if there are no further points, are we happy with those recommendations to uh, note uh, the um, annual audit letter? And could we pass on our thanks to Grant Thornton, to your audit partner and director, for all your uh, work over quite a number of years as our auditors. Um, uh, we've been very, I mean, despite the um, uh, problems over the last couple of years and post-COVID and so forth, I think compared to the pack, as it were, uh, we've been very fortunate to have Grant Thornton as our auditors. And uh, while we no longer sign off our accounts and have our audit letter already on the end of the end of July as we used to uh, it's still well ahead of most local authorities um, so thank you very much if you could pass that back to your firm um, and all the best for the future thank you you're, you're welcome to stay as a member of the public or uh, <laughs> or, or, or you can leave <laughs> thank you uh, so, uh, moving on then to next substantive item, which is the, uh, from 2022-3 uh, to 23-24, and we have the draft statement of accounts, um, which will also be going to full council, I think, on Wednesday evening. Uh, Damon, are you going to 
present this? Uh, briefly. Um, so basically you have the, um, you have the statement of accounts, the draft statement of accounts uh, for 23-24 uh, in front of you in the usual format uh, for those um, that have been on the panel for before. For those that have not been on the panel before, apologies, it's an exceptionally long document, um, but is in a, effectively uh, a largely prescribed format. Um, Basically what happens is the first part is that the council um, produces its draft set of accounts. Um, it then provides those and makes those available to firstly uh, the external auditor um, and the external auditor for 23-4 onwards is Mazars Forvis. Um, uh, as was explained just now, Grant Thornton, uh, that, was their last, um, uh, that was their last year in their, in their particular contract. Um, so Mazars have the, have the new arrangements, so that draft document's been made available to them, um, and it's also available for public inspection, um, as is required by regulation. Um, all of the timetables are sort of set out um, you know, within the document uh, itself, including the inspection period. Um, I think as I mentioned earlier, um, due to the scheduling delays that the auditors are experiencing at the moment due to having to mop up um, a substantial number of local authorities' accounts from previous years which have not been closed, they are taking precedence at the moment and therefore those of us that are trying to close our 23-4 accounts are going to have to wait just a little bit longer. Uh, the audit is therefore likely not really going to commence until about September. Um, and I think as was mentioned earlier, um, it might not be the fact that we will be signing off until into sort of 2025 uh, for this particular item. So you have the draft set in front of you. Once the um, external auditor um, has been through the, um, through the accounts, engaged officers ask necessary questions uh, to reassure themselves, um, identified any issues, any changes need to be made, etc a revised set of accounts will come back to this place um, with uh, the external auditor and what is known as their audit findings report, which I referred to earlier. That will be an opportunity for yourself to talk and, and sort of quiz the external auditor on the process, what they've found, and then subsequently to that, um, they then go to full council for formal approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Damon. Um, I don't know whether Councillor Highland, as Cabinet member, you have anything you wanted to add to the draft statement of accounts? Not really, thank you. I'm very happy with what Damon has said and I'd like to thank him for pulling it all together. It is what it is. Thank you. Well, thanks. I mean, obviously, our role as the Audit and Risk Management Panel is uh, principally um, to look in detail at the auditor's uh, report of the accounts rather than the, necessarily the accounts themselves. Uh, but it is an opportunity, which we might not have at full council on Wednesday, um, to ask any questions and make any comments on the draft accounts. Uh, I've certainly got one or two, um, but leave that open to other members. Silence. Um, so I was just going to ask about the, the most significant change between 22-23 and 23-24 is in the housing revenue account, um, where gross expenditure has gone up from 120 million to 218 million, while income has only gone up by 11 million, presumably due to rent increases, um, which means a net expenditure on the HRA for the last financial year was nearly 83 million pounds, which is clearly unsustainable. Um, so I wondered, um, presumably this is linked in with uh, investment in, 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 in Greenwich builds, but perhaps you could explain um, why, why this huge difference? Yeah, the biggest issue is just revaluation it's the revaluation of the housing assets themselves, um, which was uh, uh, resulted in, in a loss. 
there can be some very, very significant swings up and down, just depending on how they go. So that, that is the, um, the driving uh, factor behind that very big difference year on year. And um, it was the first thing I saw when I looked at the HRA as well, <laughs> so I'll admit it. So that, again, might be picked up by the auditor when they look at the valuations, yeah. Okay, no further questions or points on the, and the overall, um, they were talking in the, um, in, in the auditor letter about projected 13 million, um, but we're 18 million, uh, 18 million um, excess expenditure over income last year in the end. That was 30, about 13 million over the budget, was it? Sorry, I think I missed the start of that sentence. Whereabouts were we? Um, I was just comparing to Grant Thornton expectations um, from, 20, uh, from the previous year, but in essence, is it right, we were 18 million, um, expenditure was 18 million in excess of income uh, last year on the income and expenditure statement. And uh, but 13 million compared to the budget. Is that about right? Could you, would you be able to sign post to the page and then we might be able to pick that one up? Page uh, 97 or 21 of this report. Okay, so I found the page, and what are we looking at? The difference sort of year on year? No, no, looking at the net expenditure. Oh, that's right, that's 22, 23, isn't it? So 23, yeah. 24, yep, sorry, I, my apologies, is 98 million. So if you, to, if you were to take out the HRA from that, it would be um, 15, 15 and a half million, is that right? Yeah. yeah, there's about 84 million on revaluation, so yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you. Any other questions? Are members then happy to um, note the report? Thank you. So moving on to the last substantive item then, uh, Treasury Management and Capital Outturn. Chair, Chair, can I just make a quick comment, sorry. On related party transactions, um, generally, councillors have been really poor at responding to related party transactions. And I do feel, and I've said this to Damon privately, I do feel that there needs to be a kind of plain English letter that goes to people saying exactly what related party transactions means and where people need a declaration and to give people some options. You know, A, I have no party related party. B, I might have because I'm a trustee of whatever, you know, because you don't always know if an organisation is receiving funding from the council, yeah? Uh, and so on and so forth. And I think then people wouldn't read it as an email and think, oh, I can't cope with this. I'll do this next week. And even after three emails from me, present company accepted, I still had to phone people and say, you need to get this form back in. So I just think we need a bit of a, a step change on that one, all right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, maybe it should be like paying council tax. If you haven't paid your council tax, then you can't vote at council meetings. So. <laughs> if you haven't done your form, <laughs> I, only I jest there, but um, members, please take note. <laughs> um, so move to the last substantive item um, and uh, both the Treasury Management and the Capital Outturn report for the last financial year. 
um, and to note the recommended additional allocation of approved contingency within the priority investment programme. And this is going to be presented by Damon. And uh, on this report, we're asked if we've got any, bear in mind, we're asked if we've got any comments that we wish to make uh, to Council on Wednesday. Damon. Okay, I mean, on this one, again, it's in the usual format. I wasn't necessarily going to sort of uh, have a long sort of presentation on it. Um, I've actually uh, brought along two, two of my colleagues uh, this evening as well, um, sort of representing uh, one from the capital side, one from the treasury management side as well. Um, basically, you have the outturn um, uh, report in front of you. Uh, there's uh, one particular uh, sort of action on there, uh, which is about some additional contingency on one specific project. I think the other thing that's really sort of um, uh, that, that's drawn out by the document is the is the very very significant rise in uh, investment levels year on year. So we've moved up to sort of above 300 million pounds worth of investment in 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 a year. And of course, that's driven by we have a very uh, well established now um, sort of uh, housing program uh, in terms of the Greenwich Builds program, uh, also renovating the stock. Um, but in the last financial year. We've obviously had to take actions uh, to assist with the uh, sort of growing financial problems and, and obviously the, the other attendant uh, problems that come with the, you know, the homelessness um, uh, sort of position. And that's involved actually acquiring uh, sort of units. So there have been some substantial uh, sort of acquisitions um, of, of, of units to help improve supply uh, in that area. And, and in doing so, actually reduce the cost of, um, um, you know, homelessness provision. Um, and obviously, at the same time, providing some very high quality uh, sort of accommodation uh, for people as well. Um, I think broadly, I was going to leave it there. If anybody's got any questions, either myself or my colleagues are happy to uh, sort of answer. Thank you. Um, questions from members on the Treasury management outturn for last financial year? Uh, no. Uh, I was going to ask um, then the contribution, the four million contribution to the Elizabeth Line station, does that now complete our contributions to the Elizabeth Line station? And does that therefore give us free up resources for? other priorities? Yes. Do members have any comments they wish to um, add to full council on this report? I see none. Mm. Councillor Highland? Not, not, <clears throat> not full council, Chair, but I, I'd like members to see 1.2 and just look at, at those figures there because you can see the amount of work the council is doing in terms of investing in new homes. And that figure could have easily got lost in the report. Um, and so Damon and I thought it important to kind of just tabulate it there so that you can actually see just the investment that this council is making. That, that's it. I just draw your attention to that, Chair. Thank you. I'm conscious that this is not the report where we're looking at the capital programme. Uh, we're just looking at the outturn for the prior financial year. Um, but nevertheless, the question I think we, we need to ask because of the ballooning ca CFR capital finance requirement uh, for future years, um, which is not on the agenda tonight, um, what sort of, uh, you know, this large investment, 318 million um, in, in, in housing, which is obviously very welcome, what level of assurance do we have that A, it will um, pay for itself, both in terms of future rental yield, 
um, and uh, obviously in terms of the savings to the borough on um, temporary accommodation, which generally comes out of the general fund. Okay, so um, I suppose the, to start with the first question, which is obviously uh, the, the sort of larger one, and I think the place to look there are the potential indicators, uh, which are set as part of the Treasury Management uh, Strategy, uh, sorry, Treasury Management and Capital Strategy um, each year. Um, within those uh, potential indicators, they are your ultimate tests of whether you know, your capital arrangements are affordable, sustainable, and prudent. Um, so, for example, in there, you'll see um, one of the indicators will be about your net revenue stream. Um, so, how much of the housing revenue account, for example, um, is being consumed on debt payments, for example? And making sure that that's not rising, you know, sort of too much. We also have um, within the HRA, you know, a number of other indicators as well, um, sort of, sort of pseudo industry wide, I say industry, but lo local authority wide indicators, again to make sure that you know some of the ratios are are you know in step with with, with others. The the prudential regime, when I talked about affordable, sustainable, and sort of prudent, um, the, the prudential re regime is set by regulations. So we are working within, um, you know, a, a proper legal sort of framework. Um, in terms of the sort of the other aspects of the business and uh, sort of um, uh, on the homelessness side. Clearly, the council, alongside a number of other uh, local authorities, a significant number of the other local authorities, not just in London, um, have found themselves um, in a very difficult position financially. So with growing numbers um, of, of people finding themselves in, in this uh, sort of position, but in order to um, you know, uh, address that, it's been very difficult with accommodation um, coming off the market, so landlords uh, deciding they no longer wish to um, uh, you know, either have their property or allow it to be used um, you know, for, for those purposes. Uh, many have sold up, so supply has, has, has disappeared, uh, almost. Um, and therefore, the normal sort of supply and demand uh, economic supply, so price goes up. And and again, the council, uh, alongside many others, has found itself looking for alternatives. Some of those alternatives have, have included things like hotel accommodation. That hotel accommodation uh, attracts a significant premium. Um, so costs have risen disproportionately you know, in that particular area. And of course, are quite variable. You know, as supply and demand ebbs and flows, then you know, the, the price is quite dynamic. By undertaking the, uh, the measures that the council has done by acquiring units, it's, it's managed to lock in um, what that cost is. So it's not exposed to those fluctuations. And it's also, a, by doing so, able to sort of guarantee and secure the quality of the accommodation that is available. Uh, Councillor Bemi, did you have a, another question? Yeah, it's not necessarily a question, it's more like um, um, a comment and also agreeing totally what Damon has said. I'm actually, uh, my full-time job is in homelessness and I totally, totally understand the pressures that local authorities, almost all, I cannot think of any local authority at the moment that is not um, struggling with the weight of the cost of temporary accommodation. Um, one of the things I must say that I found quite creative with, uh, with our council here is the fact that we're thinking ahead. Unlike most other local authorities, there's still a very heavy, um, heavy reliance on, um, on um, commercial hotels. Obviously, from what you said, very rightly so, a lot of um, private rent sector landlords are withdrawing their properties, and it's not going to help matters because we know that with our new government in place now, there's the no-fault eviction, 
where most landlords are selling their properties very quickly and they're getting out. Um, one of the things I've always advocated for is the need for us to be creative. If we're spending up to 19 million a year, why are we not acquiring properties to buy and use that? Instead of paying hotels, we use those properties as temporary accommodation. So it's a good thing, and I'm, I'm really happy that we're thinking ahead. Um, unlike most local authorities that are still extremely dependent on commercial hotels. It's a good move. I something that I, I, I think we, we should encourage, we should support. It's about acquisition. Let's acquire. Thank you. I'm sure we'd all in, endorse that. Um, but, um, yeah, it would, it, at, at some point it would be useful to see some of the you know, investment cases and the, the, the figures behind this, but not, uh, not for this evening. Um, if there are no further points on the Treasury Management and Capital Outturn, are members happy to note that report with no comments to full council other than to welcome it? Thank you. Well, I think uh, that um, concludes uh, this evening's meeting. Um, so could I thank everyone for attending and uh, your patience and uh, have an enjoyable summer. <laughs>